Good morning, good morning, good morning. I am Tamara Johnson Sheely. Good morning. It is March 21st. I just cannot believe how quickly everything is moving in 2020. Let me see where my trusty co host is this morning. Good morning. Good morning, morning. Dave. How are you? I'm doing okay. So far, so good. So far, so good. You know, this uh, Corona. Virus has everybody in a in a pickle. It's um, a uh, both a a, um, a a worldwide crisis and a crisis of capitalism. And uh, uh, what we're going to see is, uh, I would say, if if everything is not uh, really really address which it is not being um we're going to have a million cases of uh of uh covid 19 of uh, new coronavirus within about three weeks there are going to be a million americans who are going to be sick and you know a good portion of them are going to be not um uh, uh not uh, no no symptoms and they're going to be spreading it even faster than it is uh, spreading already. This is crazy. I'm not sure what's going on here in Georgia, but all of the measures that have been taken have been, uh, you know, uh, a dollar short, you know. And a day late, a day late and a dollar short as the old people. Yeah. Like you can just, and, uh, the fact that they even waited, you know, you know, Trump took this for granted when this is this should have been addressed a long time ago well the other thing is that uh that you know um i think that that uh in the debate between biden and sanders sanders brought up the fact that we don't have uh you know medicare for all single payer system and biden said that wouldn't have helped italy um and that was his retort what sanders should have said was yes but it did help Singapore, Hong Kong, Taiwan, and South Korea, all of which have, uh, you know, uh, uh, single payer systems, and all of which took uh, extraordinary measures and had testing ready, uh, you know, immediately to go. Um, so, you know, there there really is uh, a lot of missed missed um, steps. Uh, you know, yeah, a lot of missteps, David. And you know, we we have to hold these legislators accountable. We got to hold this this country accountable for what they didn't do. So I'm I'm it it, it makes me really mad. Yeah, the um, uh, the the issue now is to uh, uh, for one thing to get uh, uh, Trump off the air. Uh, that's, that's <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. It's really, it's really serious. He is yeah, uh, right. He is just giving people misinformation and, uh, and scaring people half to death. Like you know, just hearing him, I don't feel any safer when he. Well, talks. The, the the it's more than just that. He is actually endangering people, um, and the, those folks who are who are listening to him, who originally you know when he said it was a hoax have been not taking it seriously, um, mm-hmm. they're going to die. They're going to die. This is, this is what the, what the book, uh, you know, by Jonathan Metzl is, it's called dying of whiteness. And, uh, the, these people are going to die. They think that, uh, uh, they think that they're, that, that what he says is, uh, is tr- uh, Trump's, you know, uh, the, it's the gospel. Uh, it's the it's gospel. Like, when he's a godsend. The, uh, it trumps the uh, the what the scientists are saying. Every time he gets up there, Anthony Fauci has to correct something that he is that he has said. He got the symptoms wrong. He keeps telling people that there are, that that everything is you know masks and protective personal protective equipment for uh, for frontline workers, doctors and nurses and other people is uh, there's millions of them on the way. Everywhere across the country, there are people of the doctors are saying we don't have enough. We're running out of protective equipment. Um, you know, they're not building up hospitals. 
uh, each state is having to uh, to institute its own responses. And you could see well, what's happening. Well, well stay, there, stay there with that thought, David. I actually heard a, a, a media coverage with uh, President Trump and Brian Kemp. And in, Brian Kemp actually asked Donald Trump to allow the states to continue to, um, you know, with the National Guard. Like he wants to yeah, activate the, the National Guard. Yeah, he wants the authority to uh, to. He has the authority. Kemp yeah, has he doesn't it. want the president to step in and tell any state what what to do. That was his yeah. bigger point. Yeah, well, you know the the this uh, this uh, National Defense Act uh, that he you know he I mean he says he does he does something and then he doesn't do it. But the point is that uh, that on top of that, uh, this is a this is a class struggle that's going on. You know, uh, the response to the to to the uh, to the epidemic and the stock market crash is that there that the the uh, uh, you know the corporate and billionaire class is attempting to make a uh, profit off of this in buying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did you did you see the article that about um, Kelly Leffler and Purdue was one of them? That actually um, was yeah. they were briefed on oh, they they they, anti they anticipated and sold stock and uh, mm -hmm. I'm 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 blanking out on his name but the the uh, North Carolina Republican there were others huh there were oh, others the, the the guy from North Carolina is uh, um, I mean he he not only did he sell the, I mean it it's so suspicious he doesn't sell stock. And now he's uh, uh, he is um, uh, very very selectively sold stock. Not only that, he warned some of his big donors uh, to uh, about while he was saying exactly the opposite uh, publicly. So the the um, uh, yeah, I mean, but that's just corruption. That's pol politic politicians and corruption. You know yeah. what, I, what we're talking about is what Naomi Klein calls the shock doctrine. Where any uh, any crisis, uh, the uh, the capitalist class will take advantage of it when people are in shock, when you know a mass of people are in shock, and uh, and uh, vulnerable, they um, uh, they find ways like the airlines. The airlines have have uh, uh, are, are 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 asking for a ba uh, a bailout after they spent fifty billion dollars uh, buying back stock. Uh, which raised their prices, which made their made millions and millions for their uh, their executives and for their big stockholders. The rest of us be damned. Yeah. So you know there there's there's a lot of that that's uh, that's that's going on, and at the same time there's an enormous pushback that's happening uh, all over the country. People are, are organizing. Uh, there are. Um, um, uh, you know, movements for rent moratoriums for, um, uh, you know, all of the all of the things that are going on. There's real social solidarity that's happening. And part of it, you know, has got to be I'm critical of the Sanders campaign, but it's really, really a lot based on uh, on the mobilization that has taken place. Yeah. And, you know, we need to do this, this 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 uh, social distancing is absolutely critical for, um, you know, for. Uh, well, I think everybody's doing what they can at this point. And we're going to bring in, we actually have a guest. Well, let me just say one last thing. Vitamin D, folks, take vitamin D. It is the best thing to to uh, to uh, improve your immune system. Uh, it's the master vitamin for all, you know, improvement of the of, of the immune system. And uh uh, now Let's we welcome have our guest, David. We'll come back to that before the end of the hour. Okay. Good, after, good morning. I want to say afternoon. Good morning, Mr. Re Reginald Hall. Good morning. How are you? I'm well, thank you. How are you? Good. Have you done a broadcast before? No. <laughs> haven't done ours, so we want to thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Awesome. Awesome. So, Mr. Sapelo Island, Mr. Reginald Hall descendant, a direct descendant of slaves that was bought to the island in what, the 1700s? That is correct. Let's start, let's start at the beginning when those ships left Africa and they 
journeyed for a long time and how how did they end up dropping certain people off <clears throat> on Sapelo Island and cer certain people like probably my family on the mainland. For those of you that don't know, Sapelo Island is off the coast of Georgia. Um, small, it's not a big island compared to other islands, right, Mr. Reginald Hall? It's about the size of Manhattan, New York. Okay. So you're about 11 miles long, four miles wide, 11 north and south, four east and west. Tell us about, let's start from the beginning. How did these how did captive Africans make it? I mean, how did they, did they just, did they bump into this island? Did they intentionally drop these people off at this island? Because some of us made it to the mainland. Like I said, my family probably made it, to the, we made it to the mainland and we were probably sold there. Well, if we start from the beginning, as we understand it, and uh, many of researchers have kind of documented, you're looking at, the late 1700s where my father's family members were living in Sierra Leone, Africa. Then as the enslavers brought the ships, most of us were taken to different islands outside of Africa to be seasoned as slaves. Mm, we have broken, would that, would, would that mean broken Mr. Reginald? Most of the times, if you use that, that would be a synonym. Yes, ma'am. Okay. And what we understand is that our family member, as a man named Balali Mohammed, was brought from Sierra Leone directly to Dr. Bell's plantation in the Bahamas, where his seasoning began. Bilali Mohammed had 19 children, <clears throat> educated man, and was known as a Muslim who believed in his practice of his spirituality. Mm -hmm. As he had the 19 children and was brought into the Americas, they left his 12 sons and brought his seven daughters. So they left the boys in the Bahamas and bought the girls, okay? Yes, yes ma'am, that is correct. And you know, that was a common practice to separate the family and not to have so much power with the strength of the boy turning into the man. Once they were brought from the Bahamas into the United States, it was told to us that we were coming through the ports of Savannah and as Thomas Spaulding being the planter was buying the slaves at the ports brought us directly to Sapelo Island. Okay. So you guys now, were sold on the, on the shores as well. You were just taken over to the island. That was where you inhabited that island. Now, now our, that is, that's in the writings. But our folks say we were delivered directly to the island because we're still an island that had plenty of entrance points for mm -hmm. ships to dock. So, you know, you never know because you weren't there. So you just have to go by, you know, either how you feel spiritually or what the story comes from your grandparent and their parent and five generations back. What we found out in all of the research over the last 12 years is that I, I seem to, am I still with you? You're with us, keep going. You're upside down. I can't hear you if you can hear me. Just keep going, keep going. What we found out is that Thomas Spaulding as the planter was not such a bad master. Now, that's how the old folks say it. When we got to the island, Bilali Mohammed being recognized as more of an educated black man coming from the Africas, Thomas Spalding decided to request that he be the rider 
and the rider, the driver, that's what they would call one of our people as the plantation holder would expect them to lead the enslaved, mm -hmm. watch over the enslaved. Well, Sapelo Island around the Southeast coast was known as nigger heaven. Mm. And in that acknowledgement, it was said that Thomas Spalding didn't work his enslaved as hard as most mainland planters would do. So as our elders have kind of passed down over the years, of course, enslavement is nothing easy and is nothing satisfying on the part of the enslaved. But they decided that because Spalding allowed us at that point to start building communities away from the south end of the island, which is where the plantation is. And because Thomas Spalding didn't work us from sun up to sundown, most of the enslaved around the southeast coast wanted to make it into nigger heaven onto Sapelo Island. Not only did he let us allow the building of communities, but the celebration within what we know as the practice that Bilali Muhammad, as a practicing Muslim came to the island, was allowed to continue that practice. So through the research, the very first mosque in our understanding that was built in the United States of America was built on Sap Island. The Risala, which is known as the Islamic text, a 13 page document was written by Bilali Muhammad on Sap Island. So let's fast forward a little bit. Got to the island, was enslaved, developed the island as it sits now. And what does that mean in development practices? Well, we dug most of the trenches. We dug most of the inlets that surround the island right now that has a tide that comes through every 13 hours, which we live by. That tide is how we eat from the ocean. And in that reference point, in development of the island, there was no machinery. There was no backhoes and excavators. So we were in the trenches digging to make what I today feed my family out of through these inlets. So let me back up. I'm gonna take you back to the late 1700s, then fast forward to March 21st, 2020. And only six days ago, was I catching the fish from the same inlet in which my father's forefathers dug. Now, that might not seem like a lot to many of us out here, but to me, that is so powerful in a spiritual notion that I'm still eating from the same inlets in which our ancestor dug, okay but let's go to something a little bit heavier. So we fast forward to March 21st, 2020. No, I don't want you to go that far. And leaving the maybe smaller note of the inlets being dug, I'm still living on the land that the ancestor had the in intellect to understand that if we purchase land, they weren't purchasing land just for themselves. At that time, they were purchasing the land for the unborn. And welcome to the world, Reginald Hall. So now, 231 years to the date almost later, I'm still able to survive in the same atmosphere as the ancestor created on an island separated by water to the mainland and not only survive but live like a king now we don't have paved roads 
on sap law. We don't have stop signs on sap law. We don't have stop lights, grocery stores. Only thing we have on sap law are our homes and each other. Now, maybe I should shut up for a minute and let you ask your question. So take us back to, you know, go back to how you, you can't hear us. You can't hear it all. Well, we can hear you. Keep talking. And he can hear us. David, did you have anything you wanted to say while he's trying to get his, uh, he can't get um, his talking then? Can you hear me, so, Reginald? He can't hear. He's having some technical. For some reason, I can't hear you on my mic. So why don't I just talk for a minute? And maybe we can figure it out. Okay. Uh oh, his camera went out. David, interesting, right? Uh, this Sapelo Island is. Yeah, I'd like to know: is this is this one of the one of the plantations where uh, rice production was going on? He, uh, you know, the the uh, the Sea Islands were were. Uh, were where, uh, uh, you know, the uh, uh, the the main crop was uh, uh, was uh, was rice, and uh, part of the reason why there was so much more freedom for slave for in, enslaved people in, on those islands is because they were highly skilled farmers, and uh, if you didn't leave, leave them alone, if you tried to push them, uh, you know, they weren't going to get the crop in. They knew what they were doing much more than anybody else. So, um, uh, you know, that's the that's part of what's happening with the. Uh, uh, as far as I know, I mean, I, I I defer, of course, to the man who's there, but uh, uh, who grew up there. With rice production. Let's ask. Was can you hear us now, Mr. Reginald? Yes, ma'am. Awesome. So, rice production. I could just tell you. Growing up, I promise you, we always had a pot of rice or some grits on the stove every single day. <laughs> so I'm sure rice production was probably a, a big part of the island. Well, rice was the staple. A lot of people along history believe that cotton was the staple. Rice was the staple. Mm -hmm. If you go back into the research, we were organic rice growers, meaning our spirits our souls organic we did that organically but then when brought into the americas there was an understanding that we understand something about rice fields there is a document in uh, i'm sorry i said document a photo in charleston south carolina in what's known as the old slave mart museum this was an aerial photo they showed how precise the rice fields were that were being dug by the enslaved. And we moved more dirt by ton than they did block to build the pyramids in some of the most horrific conditions you can imagine. Because this mosquito. was swamp. This was swampland, uh, right? That is correct. Swampland, mosquito, alligator, you had the snake. You just think of the horrible conditions that you could face in a swamp in 90 to 100 degree weather. So just imagine that you have developed a practice that made the Americas, if not tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars. So we had an opportunity to be the rice planters on the island. Hi, hello? Yeah, can you hear? I said we're having all kinds of issues this morning. Mr. Red. Yeah, well, he's upside down also. I'm, I'm, uh, I can't read his lips, so <laughs> I don't even see him on my end. Mr. Reg, is he upside down now, David? Huh? Is He's blank. Down? He's blank now. Yeah. yeah. I, I so. can see you both if you can see me. We can hear you. Oh. Is that better, David? Can you hear us, Mr. Reginald? 
Yes, I can hear you just fine. Go ahead. David, is he still upside down? Yep. Is your camera upside down, Mr. Reginald? Now he's turning over. Yeah. What about now? Right side up. Is that he's he's fine with me on my end? Is he good with you, David? Yeah, yeah. That is very okay. Distinct. That's better. All right. All now right. you got <laughs> the bright <laughs> light behind you. Can't see. He said, "I can hear all of you normally." So yeah, go ahead, Mr. Reginald. Okay. Keep still. <laughs> You're making us drunk. <laughs> and again, I apologize. It's my first time with this type of thing, so I'm just trying to. Have to We're gonna get you used to doing this, sir. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, um, where, where should we go from here? Because I, we I, I want to. We were talking about the rice production, and we had, you had moved more per ton, and you know how you know this work was not easy work, and these people have managed for generations to maintain on this island. How did the island that was a plantation inhabited now by these slaves, which is your, which was your, is your family. How did that, tr that, that land transfer into the hands of these slaves? Because it was their land, right? Well, 1865, we're looking at what we know as the freedom days. Well, our families on the islands had some forethought and understanding we purchased that land, we can be here forever. Mm -hmm. Well, our family members gathered themselves together, decided that they were gonna purchase close to 1,376 acres of land on our north end of the island and decided to name their community Raccoon Bluff. So in doing so, those 33 families over a five year period, gathered their money, paid the bank for the note on the land of $5,000. Now you know what that can equate to today, 5,000. Mm -hmm. Well, we're talking about 1871. So by 1871, they had amassed 5,000, received their deeds in their hands, and began moving on as their daily operation of farming. Mm -hmm. Because there were 33 families and they took 33.33, .33, give or take, acres per family. Well, you build the house on the west side of the island for your 33 acres and the track that runs 30 plus acres back towards the east side was your farmland. So you're talking about a massive production on an island of farming. But moreover, we built our own homes. We had what was known as a, um, I'm sorry, I'm losing the track of my thought for the name of our, we had a, 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 a machine on the island that Thomas Spalding brought to the island that took all of our wood and had the ability to take this wood to make homes out of. We then built a church in Raccoon Bluff. This church that was built was built out of the wood washed up on the shore of the 1866 hurricane. That church still stands today. So when you look at production, when you look at feeding yourself, when you look at the ability to self-sustain directly out of enslavement, you know somebody had real thought. <coughs> okay. <laughs> Can you hear us? Okay, I, you're back now. For some reason, where I'm located, we have a little bit of weather, had tornado uh, advisories coming through. So the question again becomes, on an island 11 miles long and four miles wide, we began the full process of community. That means your burial grounds, your churches, 
your activity points in some of the communities. And when you think of, our, we're looking at what is known as development. Well, I don't even know if those words were being used back in the, those days by our people, but that's what they were actually becoming were developers. So they were able to take something out of nothing under the conditions in which they were brought to the island in the first place and then have an opportunity to make sure that that grows. Now, how important is that again for what the point of our conversation becomes survival for the unborn? So when we continue to talk about this, everyone always understands that I am not here in a reference point of what I can do for us today in any activist level or revolutionary level, whatever you want to call it. And I'm only here today for those of us that have yet to be born that can have at least some form of a chance. Mr. Reginald Hall, hold that thought. We have our uh, Mr. Egberto Willies, who brings us a national update. Hi, Egberto. We haven't seen you in quite a while. Welcome to the broadcast. Good morning. How's everybody doing? Good morning. Hey, Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Great. I like. I love those fine, those few words uh, that Sapillo had to say. That was inspiring as far as who we're working for. Those not yet born. Love that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mr. Reginald Hall, his name is he. He's from Sapelo Island, and he's given us the history of this big this island off the coast of Georgia, Egberto, that literally has always been inhabited by slaves. That we were, he's a direct descendant of those inhabitants. Yeah, I just joined in, so I didn't hear the preamble to all of this, but I imagine uh, it's kind of isolated then. Mm -hmm. Oh, very, very isolated. Uh, we're 7.1 miles from the mainland, and unless you have your own water vessel, we take a state ferry back and forth from the island on a certain schedule. So very isolated. Yes, sir. Wow. Amazing. Amazing. Well, you know, it's always good to learn some history, but how's everybody doing today? Uh, are everybody locked in and tight, locked in tight? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We're locked in. Mm -hmm. and tell us what's going on. You know, we, we, we're we all watching and we're just, we're just sitting still and some people are scared. What's going on, Egberto? Yeah. We don't need to be scared, but you know, I, I did last night I was up until three and three in the morning doing my treadmill and thinking crazy thoughts and, I wrote two things that I want to use on, on my Facebook, and I, I want to just say it real quickly, if you don't mind. I said the following. You know what is sad? I am writing blogs that touch on aspects of COVID-19, whereas in the past I would consider using the CDC as a definitive source. I find myself looking elsewhere because of the loss of trust in every institution under the executive branch of government, Trump's domain. Folks, I never expected that the sycophants who would have made the trend would have made the transition as easily as they did. Ben Carson is a doctor who advised the continuation of Trump rallies. Must I say more? As I am locked in the locked in for the next few weeks, there is a lot to ponder. As someone who chose this country because of what it used to be, phenomenal. We just can't let it stand. I repeat my motto: political involvement should be a requirement for citizenship. Be involved, folks. A bunch of guys in Congress are deciding how they are going to make things right from the uh, coronavirus pandemic to the economic collapse. Let your voice be heard. This collapse was unnecessary. It is a failure of our economic system and its priorities that are ultimately responsible for the spread of the virus and ultimately the economic collapse. When an economic system is based on a gamble and favors capital over humanity, a, pan uh, a pandemic take on a life of its own, while the powerful take their time to see how best to profit from it. This is not an accident. Once again, good people will lose much of as the reinflation of the economy only make the controllers who, as we all make the controllers whole, as we all pay for it. But wait. This only occurs if we allow insanity to reign, doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. Let us stop being pawns. Are you ready? We're ready. That's a, that's a ponder of the week. <laughs> I'm ready. 
we have to do something because uh, the thing about it is all of this was foretold. And uh, I think what we had was a whole lot of, I mean, not, I mean, it's not necessarily something that they sat down and wrote down on a piece of paper, but all of this was foretold and how we get out of it is foretold unless we change it. Wow. That's that look, that's profound. All of this is foretold unless we change it because they already have an agenda, don't they? Exactly. Yeah. And that's what I was call, uh, mentioning about, uh, uh, Naomi Klein's, uh, yes. Naomi Klein's book, the shock doctrine. She just, uh, did a video uh, on, um, on, uh, democracy now. She did it on, yeah, she did it on Vox. Yeah. yeah. It was about 10 minutes long and it was yes. really brilliant. Uh, the, the only objection that I have is that she promotes that, that, uh, mythology about the new deal that somehow it was the, you know, it was the new deal like that, uh, you, David, you should have a talk with her. She's easy to get to. I interviewed her a couple of weeks ago in Nevada um, because I, I learned some of your perspective when you talk about the New Deal and so yeah. forth. And I think most of us have been conned by thinking how great it was, not realizing a lot of times how black people and people of color were really excluded from it. So I think you should have a talk with her. Yeah, well, I've I've got something almost finished that I've I've written that I hope I will be able to circulate, um, and it's really about how the Green New Deal, uh, you know, is a um, uh, uh, really perpetuates this mythology about the New Deal, and uh, what it does is it lulls us, it pre it prevents us from uh, taking the warnings of what happened in the New Deal seriously. Um, so we're uh, we're really um, uh, it's not just a um, you know a point of history that needs to be corrected, uh, but it's also what you know what the New Deal did was to uh, refurbish, renovate the uh, uh, the, um, uh, the the racial privilege system, uh, and and extended and inc into these industrial workers who were turned into uh, into white people, and uh, uh, the, the, the struggle is still going on there uh, between the, the the folks who are who are of European American descent who think and act white, um, and the rest of the working class. So you know the 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 the, the barriers to solidarity are really really uh, very uh, uh, big. They're very large. And uh, most of what the Sanders campaign and most progressives do is they think that those barriers are going to come down just by appealing to people as workers when the, uh, when the, the real need is to address them uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a way uh, to get them away from the white race. Um, so before be, before we get too far into that, we ask Egberto, Egberto, in the coming weeks, what do you foresee? Just to kind of give us some. In the coming weeks, my thought is that I think we're going to further lockdowns because I think uh, we are really going to overstress our healthcare system. Um, as far as rebuilding, I think everybody can expect to check in the mail. You know, I think. That's going to be uh, Trump's attempt to. I think it's going to be easy passing from the right because they're going to think that that's going to be a way to say, you see, we saved the economy. If you take a look at what Trump is doing, Trump is starting to uh, make this a nationalistic issue. The Trump, I mean, the, the China virus. It's no longer cor cor coronavirus or COVID 19, it's the China virus. They did something to us. So uh, now we are in a war mode. Are, I'm helping out this the community now. Let's get on with it and keep me fighting the good fight. So I think he's he's um, I think he's a great promoter. I think he's going to use the next few weeks to try to make himself look like America's savior. And it is for it's up to us to make sure from behind our lockdown to make sure that that message doesn't stick because it's an effective message that I think he's going to start uh, to put out. One last question: The elections. How how do you think this is going to affect the elections? Um, I don't know. 
I, you know, I, I rack my brain about that. The honest truth is, I don't know. I, I, I am hoping that this stuff goes past in two or three months. I think that may be wishful thinking. And if that's the case, I think uh, he is going to try to look something to hold on to power longer by delaying an election. Everybody's delaying everything. States are starting to delay their primaries. So they are given, I think one of the reasons the Democratic Party was hesitant when other states uh, put, the, put the, um, the elections off a few months is because they're fearful that Trump will use that same precedent to put the federal election off as well. Well, let me say one one uh, other thing. There, there is um, one of the things that Naomi Klein pointed out is that this proposal that they've had to um, uh, to uh, 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 eliminate the payroll payroll uh, social security taxes uh, as one of the stimulus ideas. Uh, that is a tremendous threat to working people. It's a threat to Social Security yes. because it would it would put strain, you know, a financial strain on the Social Security system, and that is what the ruling elite wants. Yes. They hated Social Security from 1935 when it was introduced, and they want to get rid of it. They want to privatize it. There's trillions and trillions of dollars that are. Um, uh, that they want to privatize. And Bush tried to do it in 2005, and he failed miserably. Uh, but the shock doctrine idea is that when we're vulnerable uh, and, uh, you know, and worried, that's when they can pass this kind of thing through. David, so, I uh, want to say a quick thing to yeah. add to that before I leave. And that is, um, interestingly, and they're, they're taking it from two sides. From the executive, I mean, from the legislative side now that they still have some control, mm -hmm. and from the judiciary. And the judiciary, in that, if you notice, McConnell is stuffing the courts with a whole lot of conservative people. And the idea is yeah. whatever laws, if Democrats don't play their cards right, whatever laws they change now, uh, mm -hmm. if, if we are, if we then get a Democratic president, Senate, and House, what's going to happen mm -hmm. is any laws they pass. They will find a niche to call it unconstitutional, and they'll have their judiciary to say you're correct. And in effect, they will paralyze democracy, and we would be stuck wherever we are whenever the the, the Republicans yes. lose power. Absolutely, absolutely. So, yeah, so you can find Egberto Willie's Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Instagram, YouTube, Facebook. This man is everywhere. Politics done right with EgbertoWillies.com. Thank you, sir. Thank you so kindly, uh, Tamara and David. And folks, you can find Tamara Sheely everywhere as well. <laughs> Bye -bye. Thank you, Egberto. Bye-bye, Egberto. Bye -bye. Good to see you again. Yeah. All right. Yeah, well, yeah that's, uh, um, that's where we are. That's where we are. Yeah. Mr. Uh, Hall, welcome back. We, we, we take a commercial break and, and get a national update from Egberto Willie's but we're back. Or how are you? Good over there? Yes, doing just fine. Thank you. Good. So where we can were, uh, where? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. Oh, okay. So you were talking about um, you were talking about the fact that this was a community. This was a this was a community when they didn't know they were building community. They, you know, they had their farmland. They had their homes. They had their the recreational areas, they had a whole sustainable, not just a community, a sustainable community that to this day is still self-sustaining. So let's go, let's, go forward, let's go forward because we have about 15 minutes left in the broadcast. What is happening? What has happened to this community that was once thriving and, and didn't need a whole lot from the outside? Well, we're now being bombarded with what most people call gentrification. So in our, well, let me just not make it a singular process. In what we're experiencing now has been the process along the Southeast coast. <clears throat> Let's move back on to the beautiful islands that we could not, as I, I say, an oppressor says to himself, we couldn't sustain back then without the enslaved as the islands were 
Well, now that the islands are developed and all of, let's say, the oppressors come back to now claim their beautiful sanctuaries as uh, black lands to white sands, which is a quote that comes from the name of a book that a young man wrote out of South Carolina. Black lands to white sands. If you think about that, the gentrification process says next to these older historical cottage style developments, let's build a palatial sun drenched estate. That means once that happens next to my grandmother's homes, the land value raises, which then raises your taxes. So as a group of lower economic people, if the wealthy gentry comes in <clears throat> and he builds the 3,000 square foot house next to my grandmother's 900 square foot cottage, well, all of a sudden my taxes will equate to what that house has caused the land value to be. So in 2012 on the island, our family members were hit with the same onslaught that happened on Tybee Island, Hilton Head, Defusky, St. Simon, Jekyll. Let's run them off with taxes because we know that they can't afford it. They being the indigenous population of the African brought over as the enslaved. Well, in 2012, I had already attained a group of lawyers out of Washington, D.C. by the name of Relman Colfax. The Relman Colfax law firm took our case pro bono under the tax situation. They won that case. They said to the county as our lawyers, you all have illegally raised these people's taxes because you had not done a tax valuation over a 17 to 20 year period. I started when the elders called me back home in 2008 with a full, I would call it, understanding of wanting to get what is known as public opinion. So I started a couple websites, started making a lot of noise. And from 2008 to 2011, I was getting somewhere. Well, the county and whatever collusionists decided to join them said, well, if we raise their taxes now, we'll have them out in a couple years. Well, they ended up as the county returning hundreds of thousands of dollars back to my family members and making a three year tax bite, which says you can't touch these taxes for three years until we figure this thing out. Now, that was 2012, which is eight years ago. The only reason we're still on the island today is because we have a federal lawsuit against the state and the county, and the state has five agencies under it in that lawsuit called Drayton, D-R-A-Y-T-O-N, versus McIntosh County. This is a discrimination lawsuit that has been now in the courts since 2015 of December 9, 2015. This lawsuit says you can't continue to violate compliance. You can't continue to violate your own public policy. You have to understand as the state and the county that with the breath in our bodies, that has now reduced us to 36 family members on the island when we were at one point upwards of 1,500 to 2,500 family members. The 36 family members that are left on the island are at a median age of 70 plus years old. So when you have taken 46 years as the state of Georgia to not be compliant, which would destroy our quality of life. And the elders having called me back into the island to say, what do we do? 
My only thought and position was to fight. Well, how do we fight? We fight with public policy and we fight with the assistance and the alignment of the federal government. I followed Dr. King's platform. If the state, county, and local governments aren't gonna do anything, let's call the feds. By doing that, I went to a department called Department of Justice, CRS, Community Relations Services. CRS from the Department of Justice came in the day after I called them and organized a nine federal agency meeting on the island which is recorded on our website, GullahGeecheeCulture.org. And that meeting spawned federal investigations. Dr. King was right. See what you can do in the feds that the force, the state, the county, and the local individuals and entities to understand that we now have information that there is some form of a collusion which can be considered a racketeering conspiracy to deprive a group of people. And once you have decided to deprive that group of people for two or more years, you have entered federal violations. Moving forward from December 15, uh, December 9, 2015 to March 21st, 2020, we are now actively inside of the federal courts with our law firm as 61 family members, not as class action. And we're saying to the government, stop, cease and desist of destroying our culture, our history, our food preparations, our language and our way of life just to steal our land. So the land that I described to you, known as Raccoon Bluff, 1,300 plus acres, is now valued at over $3 billion. And the state has made a claim after they offered to do our uh, genealogical research. And they only did that to see how they could begin to clear title to truly steal the land. So when the state came to the understanding after Thomas Spaulding left, the enslaved were free, here comes one of the worst persons we could have ever experienced to our island, even worse than the slaveholder in the time of freedom was R.J. Reynolds, the tobacco heir. When R.J. Reynolds got to the island, we were in peace and harmony of having coming out of enslavement and made our way from the 1870s to close to the 1920s. And R.J. Reynolds with his millions, if not billions of dollars was so connected to the federal government and the president at that time, President Coolidge, and many of the legislators decided that he would steal the land through shotgun force, imminent threat force, and sheer terrorism to move us off of our lands and comprise us into one 434 acre area. 434 acre area is where we were comprised to, known as Hog, H-O-G-G, -G, Hummock, H-U-M-M-O-C-K. You calling me Reginald Hall, but my last name used to be Hog because my family members took care of the hogs. With the limited amount of time we have, let me just say, now that we're in federal court, now that we have some form of public opinion, now that we understand that our compliance levels are being, again, not violated, the state has now, since 2008, upon my arrival, spent tens of millions of dollars as they're in federal court to make themselves look better to become compliant. What does compliant look like on an island? 
Put some bathrooms at our docks because our elders are getting off the boats that work. Put some handicapped parking spaces. Put the wheelchair ramps over the doors to the bathrooms that allow the elderly and the invalid to be able to use the restroom coming off of an ocean on a boat liner. Let's think about some of the things that erase the quality of life because where we stand now, Mr. Mara, is in a recovery process. We have to recover from the onslaught that has been forced upon us just to remove us from the lands. Now, how do you remove a people from the lands that don't want to go? Well, there are a number of ways. You make their water system as old as it can be. You don't allow them a trash system. You don't let them be part of the 911 system for emergencies. The county doesn't have a boat that it puts in the water to come across the water to bring our sick and shut in off the water that need emergency care. And most of us know that if you're in some type of physical emergency for your health, you have a 90 minute window. We don't even have our helicopter landing pad on the island anymore, where you can land hella flight, uh, life flight onto the island. And the last emergency we had, the young man died because we had to bring trucks from around the community to light the landing area. These are the type of things that destroy not just the community, but the people in that community. These are the type of things that we're saying to the state, the county and the local officials that have this jurisdiction over us, stop, reprogram, because we're already reprogrammed on the audit. We know what we need to survive. We need you to take your foot off our necks. So what's the process we're in now? We are actively seeking law firms that could say to us, either on a pro bono or contingency basis, we'll take your titles and deeds. We'll take your title research that you have done for the first time in the history of your family members in Raccoon Bluff, the north end of the island, 1,376 acres. We'll take that and we'll make sure that we assess and dissect that to tell us that yes, you still own the land. The claim that the state is making is a claim that we can defeat and let's make sure we stop their claim. Because once you stop a claim of another in the process of real property, they then have to go through a court system that says, you have to prove that that's your land. So we as the descendant of the people that bought that land can stop the claim, make the state attempt to prove that they own that land, which they do not. And we're not dealing with eminent domain or any type of process where the government can take your land. We're dealing with strictly adverse possession. So the state has claimed that they have used this land in an adverse possession time limit. Again, we can thwart that claim because in adverse possession doesn't mean that you can kick the people off the land and then attempt to keep those people from that land because you have the economic power to do so. So in that claim, we're saying you have again intimidated us, terrorized us, and illegally violated real estate law in the attempt to claim these billions of dollars of acres of land that we only want to farm, that we only want to develop. We don't need a Hilton Head. We need a cottage, cultural cottage style industry that will not raise the land value, that would not force the indigenous population off the island. And the funniest part about that is that was a law that the county enacted and I say funny, of course, you know, just aesthetically, the, the strangest part about that is the county wrote that law. Don't build over 1,400 square feet. Don't build over 48 inches high as to not raise the land value that could force the removal of the indigenous population of the African man and woman. Mr. Reginald, 
David, we are we are literally at the top of the hour. Is there any something yeah. you want to say to him really quick? Fascinating. Fascinating. It's powerful. Yeah. 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 Um, you know, it, it and 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 the 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 lesson is that uh, that you got to struggle, right? I mean, uh, and struggle in solidarity with one another, um, and hold together uh, your uh, uh, your people. So, you know, I I I wish you, uh, uh, you know, anything that that we can do that would help and support and look for for uh, um, you know legal support for you. I'm sure there are there are firms in uh, in Atlanta who would take up the case, but really what you're what you're talking about is fighting the state government and the county government. That sounds to me like uh, Mr. Hall what the what the struggle is about. It's it's really with the with the state and with the, with the county. Well, let me address that, David, because not one law firm in the state of Georgia will touch this against the state government. Oh. But we do have a lawyer that is willing to usher in any lawyer out of any state and utilizing his legal uh, bar license. And, you know, oh. that is a process. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And on top of what you said, David, you know, we don't have to struggle. We're being forced to struggle. I just wanted to make mm -hmm. sure that's clear because... How can you have to struggle on the island that has never been touched with pesticides and you have some of the most pure black gold dirt? I grow sugar cane right now, purple ribbon sugar cane that my grandfather started, that my father nurtured, that I'm now nurturing all of these de decades later, over a hundred years later, I'm still growing the same purple ribbon sugar cane. But our crops are crops like you've never seen. I can grow a head of lettuce as big as a uh, let's just say as big as a football field, darn near. And I'm not I'm not I'm being a little you know exaggerated. But our lettuce comes out broccoli. So when I talk to you about these lands, we're being forced to struggle. I'm talking to you about something that has been placed and forced upon us, only to gain and garner ownership of such valuable land that yeah. in a reference point of a project, let's say development project, if the land is valued at $3 billion right now, after development, you're looking at a 30 to $40 billion source of income for sales and or leases. But touch on the largest part, because we have been so downtrodden by force and, and terrorism, our industry known as tourism has been delineated, decimated, but that's the way we've made money over the last five decades. Mm -hmm. And in order to have done that, you had to be in some form of public private partnership with the state because they're claiming of the 17,650 acres that they own 99% of the island. And that is just false, false. We own at least 5,000 of that 17,000 acres that we know we have deed and title hand for over a thousand of those 5,000 acres. How do we live on an island and we can't find our six generation cemeteries? Cause they mowed our cemeteries down. How can we not live? How do we live on an island? And I can't go find my third generation grandmother because they mowed our communities down. They, I keep saying to you, they, I should be clear in saying the state government through the Department of Natural Resources, the state properties, the Sapelo Island Heritage Authority, and the governor's office himself have over the, since Zell Miller, since 1983, have decided to put this plan into effect, being that we're the last intact culture in the United States of America of Gola Kesey people on an island, still in living history. Mr. Reginald, what is your website and how, people, how can people contact you? 
again my website Gullah Geechee Culture dot org and I can be contacted through raccoonhog.com that's R A C C O O N H O G G dot com I can be reached at 912 area code 6013000 and the first website that I gave you gullagichi.org is for our public initiative website and then our community development corporation website is raccoonhog.com again that's r a c c o o n h o g g Dot com. And I will put those in the comment section for those of you um, so, so people can contact you along with your contact uh, phone number as well. Mr. Reginald Hall, I want to thank you for coming on the broadcast. You are a friend to this broadcast. Whatever we can do, like David said, to help you, we're all in. So keep us posted. I am Mayor Johnson Sheely, candidate for the United States Senate. I hear this man and I hear him with everything in me. So trust me, this is not over and we, we're right here with you mr hall right here with you um again to Mary I certainly appreciate you both having me on today because this is a message that i think will benefit a number of black families just the southeast coast maybe across the country because our idea is land recoverable i'm sorry land recovery is the only sustainable development that we can place ourselves in right now thank you, thank you again bye. Yes, you're more than welcome. You can find Mr. David at Acknowledge the Divide right here on Facebook. We're here every Saturday, 11 a.m. Today, we're going to take a mental break. For those of you that saw my post earlier, we're going to take a mental break. Uh, go to my, my personal Facebook page. For those of you that want to just kind of take a mental break with me today, 2 p.m., I will be L-I-V-E. Again, you guys, we'll see you next Saturday. Mr. Hall, we hope to have you back real soon. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hall. Thank yeah. you, David.